Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am Gina Ganscott, the Education Director here at the Penobscot Marine Museum. Tonight's program is the second in our October speaker series that features presentations from by Penobscot Marine Museum staff. I want to give a big thank you to our members and all of those of you who chose to donate to support our programming at Penobscot Marine Museum. More information about upcoming programs, membership, and donating can be found on our website and our Facebook page. This program has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities Exploring the Human Endeavor. Please mute your audio and turn off your video. And if you see that you are being muted or your video is turned off, that's me doing it. Um, we welcome questions and those can be typed into the chat box and you can type them in any time throughout the program and we will be answering them at the end. Before we get started, I'd like to know um, how many of you are members. So I have a one question poll um, and let me just click it and launch it. So you should see it on your screen. And if you can go ahead and click either, yes, I'm a member or no, not yet. Okay, we're getting there. We have a couple more people that haven't voted as they call it on here. And nine of nine, thank you very much. That was quick and easy. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Wheeler, who um, is the Penobscot Marine Museum's Digital Collections Curator. And he's gonna be talking about Costi Rohoma and logging. And it will be a great program. Uh, so there you go, Matt, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Gina. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk about Costi Rahoma and his photographs a little bit. Uh, many of you probably know something about him already. Uh, his collection came to us in 2017. We're still um, very much at the beginning of processing the collection, digitizing it, cataloging it, and recording uh, all the information we have uh, about the photographs in our database. Um, but uh, so I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit uh, about him and his career. So he was, uh, Kossi was a main photojournalist who spent his adolescence on a blueberry farm that his parents ran on Dodge Mountain in Rockland, Maine. His parents were very hardworking Finnish immigrant farmers. That was his mother, Sophia, and his father, Salim Rahoma. Uh, Kasi was expected to take over the family farm, but to his father's disappointment, he decided to follow his artistic interests. He went to high school, he went to uh, an art school, learned illustration and photography. Uh, and uh, moved out to California. He, uh, although he left his rural life behind the, the landscapes and the characters that have been familiar to him there really made a, a deep impression on him. And he often returned to this kind of aesthetic in his later work. But uh, he found his way to, to California and then uh, brought a, pro a portfolio to <clears throat> the principals at Black Star Photo Agency in Manhattan. And they, they signed him on and saw a lot of promise in him. They cultivated his talent, spotlighted him on various, in various uh, time incorporated publications since uh, Black Star often supplied content to their publications. Krosty had a number of Life Magazine covers actually fairly early in his career. These were all from second half of the 40s and he had only started working for them in 1944. So he was, had maybe something of a meteoric rise. 
he worked through the uh, final years of World War II uh, on human interest stories on the home front. He was not a combat photographer. And he, uh, yes, yeah, so he was very interested in people. He was very interested in uh, kind of homegrown stories, uh, rough and ready characters. As he, as his career advanced, uh, he gained more autonomy and he circled, circled back more and more often to his roots in, in Maine, which as we said, is, was central to his, his identity as, as an artist and as a person. And um, it was only logical since the timber, timber industry had been a defining feature of Maine's economy and culture since before we became a state, the Costi would eventually do a story on log drives. Uh, by the 1950s, log driving uh, had, had lost some of its historic romance, partly because the state's network of logging roads had been improved and more timber was being trucked to the mills. It was more economical. However, in remote forests uh, like those in, in northern Washington County and uh, on the northern stretches of the, of the Kennebec Valley, floating logs down river was still an economical way to move saw logs and pulpwood down to the mills. By the time uh, Costi photographed a series of drives in the 1950s, um, many phases of, of the log of logging were powered by gas engines and hydraulics. You know, of course, people, what loggers were using chainsaws by then, skidders were being used to haul logs from the stump to the river landings. However, once the logs were at the landing, most of the effort came from men with hand tools, and these included the pike pole, also known at least locally here as the pick pole. It was a long hardwood handle with a hook and a point on the end for pushing and pulling logs. There's one example there. And uh, the peavy, which is also known as the cant dog. And you can see what that might have been used for. You drive the point into a log and with that hook, you can grab onto the other end and and twist with a lot of leverage. Uh, th th there's a there's a beer at our uh, local Marshall Wharf Brewing Company that's that's named for for this the Camp Dog. Uh, so as it had always been, river driving was was grueling. It was dangerous. Uh, it was low paying. A lot of uh, a lot of local men, at least up in well, I'm sure it was true in many rural areas, certainly in the Machias and Whitneyville uh, area. You had a lot of local local guys and um, and in in Machias, uh, French Canadian migrants who signed on to these crews uh, because in rural areas there was nothing else to do in the spring. Uh, some of these guys had done it for most of their lives, periods of decades. Um, uh, and the log drives, you know, as we all kind of know, kept the men out in the wilderness for days on end, rain or shine, the work was dangerous, as I said before. Uh, and they signed on together to this kind of stint of, of hardship that created a, a strong and, and very masculine social bond. And I think that was part of the <clears throat> attraction for these guys. And this all made river driving a kind of a heroic occupation. And still today, log drivers are mythic figures in our collective imagination. So Costi shot three log drives uh, all in the 1950s. Two were uh, St. Regis Paper Company drives along the Machias River feeding their mill in Whitneyville. The first of these in 1954, was uh, 
started on the first Machaya on first Machias Lake near uh, the Saint Regis, the permanent Saint Regis logging camp at Fletcher Field, which is right about there. First Machias Lake right there. And the river, of course, all the way down here in Machias, about 50 miles. Uh, there was another, excuse me, there was another drive in 1958 on uh, Old Stream. And Old Stream was a, uh, is a tributary of the Machias River. It's very remote. And you can see it where my pointer is way up at the top of the map here. It lets into the Machias River down here at Matamo Place. And that's a good long run. Old Stream is a twisted, gnarly uh, river that nobody in living memory at the, at the time that this drive happened uh, had ever run. And the company had, had made some improvements. They had built some dams and abutments and cleared out rocks and other obstructions. But uh, it was uh, going to be an adventure. And Costi photographed this drive. Uh, strangely, we have all of the captions from his photos for this drive, but we uh, don't seem to have the photos. They didn't come to us with the rest of the collection. We think it's possible that he shot this drive in color and that those photos were used in True Magazine. And we do have a copy of that magazine with some color photos that None of us is recognized from going through the negatives. Uh, the other drive was um, started way up here at Wyman Lake on the Kennebec. And this was for a different company altogether. It was for the Kennebec Paper Company. It was a pulp drive. Wyman Lake, as you can see, is just north of Moscow. And uh, this timber went all the way down to Augusta, which uh, again, I think was about uh, 50 miles. So, um, you know, the fact that we, uh, we have the photographer's notes and captions from uh, all of the log drives that he did, but only some of the photographs. It's made it very hard to, uh, to describe them and, and uh, match the photos to the captions. And one, one of the things that made it even more complicated was that somebody at, uh, at Black Star at some point had mixed up the negatives from the Kennebec River pulp drive that I mentioned, and the Machias River Drive in, in 1954. They were all shuffled together like a deck of cards. Uh, so it's kind of a nightmare. We had to go back through the archive film strips um, to make sure that, in fact, those were two separate log drives. Uh, one of the things that made it easy to tell them apart was that the, the negatives from the pulp drive seemed to be a little yellowed, or they had a, a different tint. And you can see the difference here. So a pulp drive, I'm going to go back to the slideshow. Uh, you know, while log drives are all alike in, in many ways in terms of processes and tools, there's a big difference between a, a log drive or a saw log drive and a, and a pulp drive. Pulp wood, of course, is used for making paper. Typically, the trees are cut. Uh, the trees that are cut are five to nine inches in diameter measured at breast height. Uh, they're cut into four or five foot lengths. And uh, from what I can see in the photos and from what I've read, a pulp drive sounds like it was pure grunt work. There weren't very many special skills needed. The, this, is a, this is a photo from Wyman Lake, which I mentioned, you saw on the map. It's about 30,000 cords of pulp wood. And again, we don't know this year uh, 
the in the captions we find that uh, on the day they wanted to start the drive there was uh, no wind and they had to tow with a boom tow uh, this enormous mass of pulpwood down to the south end of the lake so they could send it through the sluice gate in the dam and <clears throat> Unfortunately, the river was really low that year because there hadn't been a lot of snowfall, so there wasn't a lot of runoff. And they had to resort to using a bulldozer to push thousands of cords off the bank that had become stranded that they had been counting on the river picking up. Uh, so you can see here that um, A pulp drive was, uh, you know, a lot of wading up to your knees or up to your hips in icy water, in undergrowth, using pulp hooks and pike, ho pike poles to pull pulp logs out of the underbrush, get them moving downstream, <clears throat> downstream again. Uh, there was nothing too glamorous about it. We're not going to spend too much time on that. As a a St. Regis supervisor once told Costi in a letter, there's nothing too spectacular about a pulp drive. So distinct from uh, the pulp drive was the saw log drive. And uh, this is where, this is the kind of heroic work that we were talking about. This is where most of the mythology of the log drive originated. Excuse me. So again, the photographs we have of, of, of a log drive are from 1954. Costi had been with St. Regis for about 10 years, or excuse me, had been with Blackstar for about 10 years at that point. Uh, so it's likely that he created that assignment for himself. Also by that time, St. Regis was the major landowner in the Machias River Valley, they owned about 700,000 acres of, of standing timber, and they were the only company driving logs on the, on the river at that point. This is what uh, Byron McFeeters, who was a uh, logging supervisor for St. Regis, had to say about the, uh, their harvesting practices at the time. He was also the um, kind of the job boss or overseer for the, for, the, for the 54 drive, so Costi met him. Byron McFeeders, and uh, we don't worry too much about titles, but among other things, I'm called the logging superintendent. The uh, log driving on the Machias River dates back to pre-revolutionary days. We cut now about uh, 5 million feet annually. That would mean uh, with the size of the logs running between 80 and 90 feet, that there would be between 50 and 60,000 pieces in this year's drive. We uh, cut our logs in the winter and we try to cut the valley and our holdings here on a sustained yield basis. I mean by that, that uh, we uh, cut uh, only the annual growth so that the uh, valley will, uh, and the growth in the valley will perpetuate itself. Uh, we have done our best to get good utilization in later years and hope that the Machias River Log Drive will continue for many years to come. Uh, <clears throat> so that was from a, an interview that WLBZ TV up in, in Bangor did in 1957. So it wasn't too long after Costi photographed this drive. So on a log drive, the work began in the, in the fall. The crew would go up into the woods, cut uh, temporary new roads for moving timber. Uh, the timber that was harvested in the, in the fall and winter, uh, mostly pine and spruce in the, in the Machias River Valley was dragged over the logging roads in 16 foot lengths. And, uh, and it was important to do this in the winter because that's when the ground was frozen and it was a lot easier and 
less costly to, to move it then. It was stacked at the river's edge. Uh, often the, the cutting was focused up near the headwaters or above the major logging dams so that the, the bulk of the log drive could start from that one spot. Uh, on the 54 drive, of course, this was uh, Machias Lake. I'm going to see if I can show you a photo of the timber waiting there. So, yeah, this is uh, part of over a million feet of lumber waiting on First Machias Lake for the drive to start. This was about 50 miles upriver from Whitneyville. So uh, the drives, uh, typically started at a, at a permanent camp for the St. Regis Paper Company. This was uh, their permanent camp at Fletcher Field, which was near First Machias Lake. Uh, this first shot is a, is a group photo of the logging crew in 1954. And this fellow under my pointer here is Francis Healy. He was the kind of supervisor for the drive under Byron McFeeters. He was a very experienced driver at this point. We're going to hear something from him a little later on from a different interview. This is inside the camp early in the morning at breakfast time. Lots of pancakes bacon and eggs, uh, coffee, toast, cakes and pies, a lot of calories. Log driving burned a lot of calories. This was the cook at uh, Fletcher Field Camp. And that, I think that's his assistant behind him who might've been called a, a cookie. In the early part of the drive, <clears throat> uh, at least, everybody came back to Fletcher Camp or Fletcher Field Camp in the evening. Here's a here's some photos of uh, the crew playing cards, doing a little bit of gambling. You can see socks drying up in the uh, up in the rafters there. Big pot-bellied stove, and. Uh, That's the only, uh, there, there may have been another camp. There's some evidence of that in uh, some photos that we'll see later. Uh, but that's the only camp that I read about in the, in the photographer's notes. Uh, there was no mention of, of the crew camping in the woods. So I'm assuming that uh, throughout the course of this drive, they must have come back to Fletcher Field Camp. One of the terms that was very important to a log drive was uh, the concept of a driving head. A driving head is uh, a, a volume of water in the river that's enough to keep uh, the logs afloat to prevent um, snags on, on boulders and underbrush and so forth, but not so high that uh, receding levels would strand logs on the banks. Uh, this was measured at various places along the river and not just at the start of the drive. I'm going to see if I can show you some pictures of that.
the one location that uh, was used to make this measurement was um, was Drowning Rock. And we'll uh, look at a couple of photos of measurements being taken there. According to the photographer's notes, when the water reached uh, up to 37 and a half inches in the bowl, that was a driving head. That was enough water to drive logs. So once it had been determined that uh, the level of the river was right, uh, the crew would start watering in the logs. And that simply meant that the logs that were stacked on the landings were rolled on skids that the crew had set up down uh, this gradient, which was sometimes called a rollway, into the river. And you can see here that the crew is using PVs. In this case, it looks like they're trying to pry a log out that's stuck in the mud, but behind them you can see logs rolling down these skidways toward the river. In they go. Big splash. And that was a time consuming process. Once, uh, once the logs were afloat, they'd be held in a boom, uh, which simply was a long chain of, of logs linked end to end. And we did see a photograph of this already. I'm gonna show it again. Uh, forming a, a kind of corral. And you see that rope there, there was, uh, the, there was a gate end of the boom, which was tied off to a winch, which held it close while they were waiting to start the drive. And uh, when the drive started, they slowly play the rope out and uh, meter the logs out of the gate end. So they were going out into the river, well, in this case, into uh, the bottom of the lake toward the dam uh, in, a, <clears throat> you know, in a steady stream so that they weren't going to create a jam. And, you know, of course, a jam was, was the bane of a, of a logger's existence. Everything that was done, was designed, was, was uh, intended to keep the logs moving. And, and the only thing that could keep that from happening was minor snags, uh, which could eventually turn into jams. On the 54 drive, uh, the boom broke in the middle of the night and caused this epic jam, which took the crew of, I think, 16 guys an entire, most of a day to, to, to free up. And you can see it there behind them. It's a nightmare. And when this happened, the trick obviously was to get the, the timber moving, as you can see at the leading edge of the jam. Uh, typically, the, it was the more experienced river drivers, who were also called river pigs, at the front. Because as the logs loosened up at the front, uh, the footing became less stable. You had to keep your balance. And there was no guarantee that any one log was going to support your entire weight. So often you had to have your feet 
on two logs simultaneously. It looks to me here like there was kind of a temporary abutment created along the edges of this jam where they were loosening logs up so that they wouldn't drift off and get snagged among those trees in, on, the, on the flooded riverbank. So that was there to help keep them in the current. Uh, if there was a particularly intractable jam or a or jam that was hard for anybody to get to on foot, they would sometimes take a scow out to where uh, the logs were uh, jammed up in the river and uh, dynamite them. And here you see a couple of crew members getting uh, a box of dynamite ready to take with them uh, for the day's work. I don't know if you can see this, but the guy leaning over the box is smoking a cigar, or at least he has a cigar in his mouth while he's packing dynamite near cans of gas. Uh, to be fair, maybe uh, the cigar is not lit. So this was an, ex an example of a, of a jam that nobody was going to be able to get to on foot to free up because it's right in the middle of some rapids. So somebody took a scow out there, planted some dynamite, cleared out, and up, up she goes. And that was usually enough to, uh, to get things moving again. There's a, um, I'm actually, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I think I'm going to play you. There's a, a clip from this interview with Francis Healy. And he was, uh, when he got to be older, he was uh, in a nursing home in Machias called Marshall, Marshall Manor. And he was interviewed by uh, a man whose name I've forgotten. He was, at this, this man at the time was the director of the Maine Folk Life Center at UMaine. So this was 1986 when he interviewed Haley, uh, Healy. Healy must have been very old then and, and his health was not great, but he was still very lucid. Uh, so uh, if you'll bear with me for just a second, um, given that this is kind of impromptu, I'm gonna see if I can play this clip for you in which Healy talks about dynamiting a Beaver Dam. Uh, and that leads us into, that veers slightly into another topic, which is that uh, one of the ways that the, the height of the river could be increased if it started to recede too much and there was still timber on the river is that the, uh, the the crew bosses would have a, a, an ace up their sleeve in the form of uh, water that was dammed on tributary streams and in the headwaters. And they could lift the sluice gates in those dams to create artificial freshets to flood the river and pick the logs up and keep them going. And so Healy is here talking about uh, a, an instance where he, um, was not able to get the water he needed. And I'll see if I can get it to play. If not, we'll just move on. No, you can't hear a thing, too bad. It's a, it's a very funny story. I'll uh, recap it for you, shall I? Um, this, uh, it was a different drive. It wasn't the 1954 drive but he uh, radioed for the dam to be opened on uh, above First Machias Lake on one of the other uh, headwater lakes. Didn't get anything and they said, we haven't got any water here. And 
and he said, what am I going to do? And he uh, got somebody to fly him in a plane up there with some dynamite. The caps for the dynamite were brought around in a car. Uh, he, he got up there and saw that the sluice gate was, had been completely dammed up by a beaver with alder twigs and clay. And so they couldn't open it. The, and, and the water was starting to ooze out around the sides, around the wings. But uh, it wasn't enough, and it was actually threatening the integrity of, of the dam. So they, uh, they mined uh, the beaver dam and with uh, almost an entire box of, of dynamite, he recounted. He saved 20 sticks out, thinking he might need them, and he did. And that plug blew down the river 150 feet and landed again, in the river and, and created another jam. So he was able to, with a pole, uh, he, uh, he fastened the end of 20 sticks of dynamite bound together to the end of a birch pole, climbed a birch tree, lowered the second charge down into this, this mass of clay and alder in the middle of the river, and touched it off with a very long fuse, he set a very long fuse. He scrambled down and he said, I ran like hell and hid behind a rock. And he was able to blow it apart. Uh, anyway, I wish we could have heard that. Uh, let's see. So we've heard a little about, uh, about log jams. Uh, and, and I talked to you about the people who were particularly adept who were sometimes called bubble walkers, who would be at uh, the front of the drive or at the front of a jam. And they were called bubble walkers for their skill in, in balancing on logs and moving from one to another and timing their steps precisely so that they didn't get dumped. And uh, there are a few photographs here of of somebody who fit this description. And you can, so you can see the front of this mass is starting to get loose and he's having to stay moving even as he's rolling logs around. And you can see there he's balanced on two while he's propping himself up with another one. There were several breaks throughout each day on the river uh, because it was incredibly grueling work. As we know, loggers needed a lot of calories. These are some photographs from a lunch break in the woods early in the drive. See, they're just sitting out under the trees. These lunches uh, were very high in carbohydrates. Uh, a lot of beans, some cold cuts, but bread, pastries, cakes, pies, cookies, a lot of sweets. Costi was amazed by the quantity of sweets that these guys would eat. And hot tea was the drink of lagers. So you had that at every break and uh, during lunch. Uh, the, somebody from the crew would start a fire and the cook and his cookie would show up, uh, either, uh, bringing, uh, the food and the utensils in by road or by, uh, Wangan and Wangan was the name of, uh, a, a caravan of of scows used to carry supplies around. And you can see the tin cups parked on a fork twig there. I can't imagine, that's Costi himself eating lunch. And this, this photo is actually from the pulp drive, but I thought I'd throw it in here so we could see him uh, 
in with the crew and he got very friendly with them. They were very pleased to have him back in 1958. When uh, things were going well, you just had the river carrying the timber freely. Here are the, here are the saw logs starting their 50 mile journey down river. Uh, coming up behind the uh, the drive were the crew that had been stationed in the rear, and uh, the the term for the the term for coming up behind the drive and keeping the logs at the back moving and freeing up those that had snagged on the edges of the river. What the term was cleaning, cleaning the rear, which which has some other unpleasant connotations. But um, this was work that was often assigned to less experienced members of the of the crew. One of the one of the tasks uh, that was necessary is that uh, often uh, at, at, at bends in the river, I think this happened on every drive, a pocket of, of logs would be allowed to, to accumulate at a bend in the, in the river and that was called a wing and the purpose of it was uh, to keep uh, the rest of the logs in the current. They kind of glance off the edges of, of this wing where the logs were kept you know, oriented with the current and uh, then you wouldn't have a jam build up in uh, at the bend. So when the crew came to clean up the rear, they'd have to break up the wings. And that's what you see these two guys doing here. And that's Francis Healy uh, down in the front there. You, know, you can see, uh, you know, at the rear uh, of the drive, you often get logs snagged in underbrush. And that was one of the tasks for the guys in the back could get pretty sticky. Uh, in uh, historically, there were boats called bateaux that were used in the same capacity that these scows were, but you couldn't, it was hard to put a motor on a bateau. They were double ended. And I don't know if that's the reason that they fell out of use, but by this time, as you can see, people were using scows. They were more stable and you could stick a motor on them. So the scows were a mobile work platform and these provided support to the guys who were cleaning up the back end of the drive. If uh, something got particularly wedged, they might bring in a gas, portable gas powered winch, which you see this character carrying. And you can see him back here. They, and, and it's a bit hard to make up, but there's a chain connected to a log here uh, that they're pulling out of the underbrush. I'm running a little short on time. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly show you some photos of, of uh, an experienced scow driver running some rapids. This was a Carrick pitch. And there's some pretty good audio of, of Healy talking about running through Carrick pitch as well. You can see there, I think these are probably class two rapids. I've never been rafting, but. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that that's what these are. Maybe, I mean, they're navigable, obviously. You can barely see the scow there, of course, but uh, 
these guys pretty much know what they're doing. You'd have to guess they do, since one of them is standing up in the middle of the boat, where uh, obviously the footing would be the most stable. And off they go. The last photo that I'm going to show you tonight is, uh, and this is not from this is not from Costi's collection. This is from a a shoot that Red Boudelier, who's another one of, uh, he's another photographer who's worked in the photo archives at PMM. He photographed a drive in 61 on the Machias. And some of these same guys were part of the drive. And it seemed like the, the technology is not going to cooperate with me. But um, this is the very end of the drive in the, in the mill at, here it comes. Maybe not. Yeah, there we go. So this is the Passamaquoddy Mill at Whitneyville. And the logs come down into another boom. Some of the crew will have been brought down river in a bus. St. Regis had a 47 passenger bus that they used to move personnel around. And these guys would be uh, responsible for guiding logs onto the conveyor belts that you can see there in the background. Uh, and this is where the mill gets sawn into lumber. Uh, you know, there's so much more we could have talked about, but this is a limited amount of time. And I want to leave a few minutes for any questions that come up. So please feel free to fire away. Thanks, Matt. They have a lot of great content. Um, so if you do have a question, please uh, write it in the chat box and then we can answer it from there. But while we're giving people a chance to kind of think about questions, Matt, Hazel had said, awesome pick at breakfast. And I'm wondering if you could pull that image up so we can kind of take a closer look by zooming in. Sure, the uh, breakfast table? Yeah, I think that's the one. Sure thing. And again, if you do have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat box. Yeah, so you can see here, there's a lot of toast. I see biscuits, I see cake. Actually, it looks like there's somebody right there with, it looks like it must be a movie camera. I don't know who that would be. We need to find that footage. Absolutely. Uh, fried eggs there in the foreground. Yeah, so, um, you know, it makes me think of the way that people ate in the little house on the prairie books. Just more food than you could imagine sitting down to. Uh, if we run out of questions, I did find that audio clip of Healy talking about blowing up the beaver dam, if, if we're interested in hearing that. Sure. So Sarah just says, beautiful photos, very interesting, thank you. And Hazel says, the portraiture is wonderful, and that's very true. And yeah. then you can, you can close us out with that um, audio, if you'd like, Matt. I'd be happy to. And thanks for noticing um, Costi's great portrait work. That was one of, of his powerful strengths for sure. He was a very um, uh, kind of, uh, what do I want to say? Well, he was just very attuned to his subjects and had a way of, of putting them at ease. So uh, yes, so here's Francis Healy talking about blowing up a beaver. We've been, we've been driving for a week, 10 days. Finally gone underwater. The audio is a little uh, quiet, so please water. turn up your volume if you can. Airplanes, you know. I said, you can. 
says, oh, that was a dynamite. Well, he says, don't bring anything else, because he says, I can't hold no caps or anything like that with the dynamite. Oh, I said, that's all right. Well, let's send the car around the other way. And we brought the, brought the uh, caps in around by Wesley. I see. I see. Brought them in that way. Well, because of that, the water was running right over the, the dam. And the water was washing it out pretty darn fast. I said, I got to get the rag out. So I went down right in the, right in the food skate. Right, right where well, you, well, you used in the old dam, where well, you had a sluice gate in. I don't know. So the people filled that gate, chock full of alders and uh, clay. Just as tight, good God, he didn't leak a drop of water. Of course, then he, when he got full now, then she began to run out of the wings. Yeah. And then the wings began to wash. Awful mess. There still wasn't enough water coming through. No, wasn't enough. We got, I got that done. I uh, put that case in. I put a whole box, all the 20 sticks. I kept 20 sticks for just in case. Well, when that box went off, I thought, damn, damn, might have full of water. Hold it. Hold it. Oh, it's quite big. That's four gates in it. When that went off, that dam was right up there. And when she came down, she went about, about 100 feet, 100, oh. 100 and 150 feet. Right down the river. Of course, there was all that water that was well, behind it. So the water just pushed it down the river? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, it went up in the air. Uh -huh. came down. Yeah. That water picked it right up. Well, right. Uh, I was worse off not then than I was when I started. It plugged the river again. So I was, it, right on the bank was a big birch tree. Great big one. It was limbed way down the bottom. Well, I went and took my axe. I went and I cut some little small suckers, you know, two of them, all oh, 10 or 12 feet long, and tied them together with end of pieces of rope, put them 26 right on the end of it, and I went up that tree, and I reached out over, just as far as I could, right out over the water, you know. And I lift that, I put a quite long fuse on it, because I didn't want to be too short, because I might get in trouble getting the shore. I could see. So I, uh, I test her off and put her in there, and then I run like down that tree, and then I run like hell up across the country. I got this big rock up there, and I, got, I crawled in behind that. Well, so you, it struck everywhere, but on that rock. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I have for you, everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here for the presentation on Kasturahoma and the bygone log drives of Maine.